Well, thank you everyone for coming to our first lecture night, first Thursday night lecture at the Hype Preserve this year. My name is Florence. I'm the membership and outreach coordinator here at the Preserve. And it is my pleasure to introduce our guest speaker um, for tonight. This is Jonathan Townsend. Uh, Jonathan grew up near uh, Olean, New York, where he developed a lifelong love and passion for the natural world, particularly bat biology and conservation. This fascination with ecological relationships led him to pursue a BS in environmental science and an MS in biology, both from SUNY Fredonia. Jonathan has worked with various state and local municipalities, private environmental consultants, and nonprofits in his career, and focuses on studying bats and promoting the many benefits they provide. Currently, Mr. Townsend is a PhD oh. candidate in the Department of Geography at the University of Buffalo, where he is investigating bat habitat use through species distribution modeling, assessing the conservation status of bats in his project area, and taking the first ever look at the potential for plastic pollution to impact bats through the insects they eat and the water they drink. He also co-owns Royal Fern Nursery, a native plant nursery specializing in western New York flora. Jonathan sits on the board of directors at Greystone's Bat, Bird, and Butterfly Sanctuary and is, and is an adjunct professor in the geography department of UD. Could everyone give me a big hand in welcoming? for that wonderful introduction. So I'm John. I'm about to head into my fourth year in the doctoral program at UB. And so the presentation I'm giving tonight is a version of my research presentation where I'm looking at the biogeography and conservation of bats in Chautauqua County. And if anybody's familiar with New York State, you might realize Chautauqua County is a bit removed from where we are at right now. So it's kind of as far west as you can go and still be in New York. So I'm uh, going to talk a lot about Chautauqua County specific things, but at, towards the end of the presentation, I'll link that with the Hike Preserve and what brought me out here to do uh, this presentation this evening and some of the, the bat surveys that I've done over the last several days. So just to give you some introductory information, um, you might not all be bat experts, so I thought a little bit of information about bats without getting too distracted would be pretty important. So bats are in the order Chiroptera. They're the only true flying mammal. So things like flying squirrels and flying lemurs are just kind of falling with style. They're not actually capable of sustaining flight. There's also tremendous diversity. There's species of bat on every continent except Antarctica because bats are smart. And to date there's been over 1,600 species of bat identified to science. So when I'm talking about the tremendous diversity, well, I'd be remiss if I didn't point out the Townsend's Bigger Bat, which I went back in time and named after me. <laughs> but these are all examples of insectivore bats. So these all eat insects. So you have the Townsend's Bigger Bat, the Pallet Bat, and just below that, the Spotted Bat. And you might notice the enormous ears that they have. So they have those enormous ears um, to help them hunt. So for example, the Pallet Bat in the top corner that hunts things like centipedes and scorpions in the southwest United States. And so they can literally hear the footsteps of a scorpion on the desert floor in pitch black and find it and hunt it, and they're immune to their scorpion stings. So really cool stuff. Um, in the bottom corner is the Brazilian free tail bat, and you might notice that the ears are not quite as big. So Brazilian free tail bats are what we call aerial hawking, hawking bats. They catch things out of the sky as they're flying. The other bats are gleaners. They're picking things up off the ground or off of the leaves of branches and whatnot. The Brazilian free-tailed bat has been clocked flying at over 100 miles an hour. So people always give peregrine falcons all this credit, but again, they're just falling really fast. <laughs> and they can, uh, specifically the Brazilian free-tailed bat can have a tremendous impact on the corn industry where they're at. So in places like Texas, where you'll have uh, the largest bat colony on the planet, there's about 20 million Brazilian free-tailed bats living in Bracken Cave. They can spread out and flying at 100 miles an hour, they come out and emerge for the evening, and so they're not only controlling insects, they're controlling insects you know, far across the landscape. So moving on to some uh, non-insectivorous bats, we have the banana bat, which is a nectar feeder. 
So you can see the difference in morphology in their, uh, the snout to kind of push their nose down into a flower and lap up the nectar. Whereas the tube-nosed fruit bat and the other, the grapefruit-eating bat and the hammerhead bat are all fruit-eating bats, so they have different adaptations, such as the, the tube-nosed fruit bat has those special snouts, which are, uh, are good at smelling fruits, but they're also really good at preventing it from choking on the fruit juice as they kind of like smash their face into <laughs> the fruit. Pretty messy eaters. And then uh, down on the bottom, that is a male hammer-headed fruit bat. So the females look a little more normal. The males have these massive snouts, which enable them to produce really loud honks, which just drives the ladies wild. <laughs> so why would I want to study bats? Well, first off, they're super cute. Right? <laughs> Um, they're also keystone species, so they're important in every environment that they're in. They're indicators of uh, ecological health and complexity. They're apex predators, so they control a lot of insect populations. And collectively, they provide these ecosystem and economic services throughout the globe. So they're not just good for the environment, they're good for our wallets too, right? And so just to go over a few of the ecosystem, like the major services they provide, one of them is pollination. So here you have an orange nectar bat pollinating a tank plant. And I really love this image because you not only see it's getting down to the hypanthium of the plant to get the nectar, but it's also, you notice this curved stamen at the top. Mm -hmm. So that stamen has evolved to be curved to brush up on the forehead of a foraging bat. Mm -hmm. And as that bat goes from flower to flower, it's spreading the genetic diversity of those plants as well. So they're not just pollinating, they're improving the genetic quality of these plants over time. They're also important in seed dispersal. So uh, about 20 years ago, Bat Conservation International did a study on seedless short-tailed fruit bat. And without getting into a lot of the, the details, they found that a colony of just 400 individuals can disperse hundreds of millions of seeds every year. So just 400. And if you're ever lucky enough to go down to the tropics and play with bats, you'll see that bats are everywhere. Like the last time I was down there, we would put up a net to catch a bat, and before we had it staked out, we were catching bats. So a large number of bats, high biodiversity, and so these kinds of things translate to very potent economic services. And tropical bats are known to reforest, uh, deforested tropical ecosystems. So the trees that regrow after we cut them all down are those that are dispersed by bats, or at least the first trees. Are. Nutrient cycling is also a critical uh, ecosystem service. So a lot of farmers around here know that guano is a pretty good fertilizer for plants and bats while they're flying around they're pooping a lot. And that's kind of a weight thing plus they eat a lot so they gotta poop a lot. And in experimental conditions you can see that um, for example down here under G this T7 these are plants grown with higher concentrations of guano and these are plants grown with lower concentrations of guano. So a pretty clear benefit there. And it's also kind of interesting, so insectivorous bats have a high nitrogen content in their water. Fruit-eating bats have a high phosphorus content in their water. And what, taking it a step further, around here, all of our bats are insectivores, and our soils are generally uh, nitrogen limited. Down in the tropics, most of the bats tend to be uh, fruit bats, so they have phosphorus in their water. And in the tropics, soils are phosphorus limited. So I don't know if bats did that on purpose, but we <laughs> thank them for that too. And then finally, uh, controlling insect populations. So this is one of the services that strikes closest to us here because, all, like, again, all of our uh, bats are insectivores. And here we have a big brown bat, which is our most common species in North America right now. And big brown bats eat a lot of bugs. And I, I don't want to bore you with all these numbers, but if you put this all together and uh, divided by, uh, so this was looking at a colony of 150 bats. If you compile these and divide by 150, each individual bat is controlling insect populations to the tune of about a quarter million every summer. So that's quite a large number of insects. And looking at the, the final column on this table, these bats are protecting cucumbers, corn, soybean, cotton, uh, lawn care and nursery industries, potatoes, apples, etc. So really important in protecting our agricultural systems. And in a time of a changing climate, uh, instability in our agricultural system can lead to some food shortages which we really don't want to deal with, right? And so here's an example of 
a study that looked at the economic benefit that bats have to agriculture. And these researchers went through county by county and evaluated the worth of these insectivorous bats. So the numbers on the screen are multiplied by $1,000. So for example, um, this is a Chautauqua County specific presentation, so that little red circle up there is where Chautauqua County is at. And so that translates to about 11 to $14 million a year of benefit just to Chautauqua County. And one little known fact about Chautauqua County is it's the poorest county in New York. So having that benefit to our struggling farmers is pretty important stuff. But despite being super cute and super important, bats are impacted just about everywhere on the planet. One of the main impacts that bats face is human persecution. They've got a terrible PR problem. Uh, people just think all sorts of nasty things about them. They think that they're you know, evil, which obviously they're good. Uh, people think they spread diseases, which they do not spread diseases any more than any other group of animal on the planet. And they there's never been a documented instance of a bat giving anybody COVID ever. So <laughs> keep that in mind. Uh, climate change and habitat degradation and loss are some of the typical things that uh, most animals around the planet face, particularly bats. So they're, they're known to be sensitive to things like that. And I'll focus on two of the um, most severe conservation issues facing bats in our region, which is true for Chautauqua County and it's also true out here. And those are white nose syndrome and wind energy development. So white nose syndrome is a disease caused by a fungus called Pseudogymnoascus destructans. It impacts bats that hibernate in caves. So these are bats that form large colonies during the summer where the females raise their pups communally. In the wintertime, they fly up to about 150 miles away and hibernate for the winter. Where we are at right now actually has the unfortunate claim to fame of being the epicenter of white nose syndrome. So Schoharie County, um, Howes Cave, and was it we were looking at this earlier, Florence. House and Hales, Hales Cave. Cavern. Yeah. Cavern. Um, just nearby here is where white nose syndrome was discovered. So in 2006 and 7, biologists noticed hundreds of thousands of dead bats around these caves. So every three to five years, uh, biologists will go to Hibernacula and just count the number of bats that are hibernating. So when they went to go do their regular assessment, they found all these dead bats, and uh, the disease kind of spread from there and continued to spread. And so far, over 6 million bats have died in the United States and Canada. And you can see where they get this, uh, this name from. So the disease causes like a ringworm type of infection on the, the skin of the bats, uh, forms that white powdery uh, growth on the nose and the wings and the ears and things like that. It also causes a number of other things. And this is a pretty busy table, but I wanted to just focus on a couple things. So uh, looking down at the left arrow moving downward, so the, the fungus colonizes the bat. It starts to rupture the skin cells and forms ulcers. Uh, it can literally eat away the wings of a bat, the membrane. And so when bats come out of hibernation, their wings can be just totally shredded. And they can recover from that. But in the meantime, they're not as successful at breeding. So you have uh, issues with reproductive success. Uh, looking at the left arrow going down, while they are hibernating, Bats have really refined metabolic needs, so they might breathe once every six seconds and their heart rate drops and their blood temperature plummets. They're almost essentially shut down as living things while they're hibernating. White nose syndrome wakes them up from that state. And so sometimes even just a minute of arousal during hibernation can be enough to deplete all the stores they have for the winter. And so what you have is uh, they starve to death, the ruptures in their wings and their skin causes dehydration as they kind of dehydrate while they're sleeping. And so if they survive all of that and, and emerge in the spring, they might die from a secondary infection in the wings, or like I said, they might survive. There's a lot of wildlife rehabilitators that will take in bats and take care of them over the summer until their wings regrow, and they can recover from pretty traumatic wing energy, uh, injuries. So that's nice to see, but in the meantime, the reproductive success is what's missing. And so as a result of all of this, um, You've seen declines of 90% or more for several species of bat, which include the little brown, northern long eared and tricolored bats. You also have species like the Indiana, eastern small-footed, and big brown bats that are, to a, a lesser extent, impacted by this disease as well. And you can see that showing in this graph on the right. You have the 
survey year with total bats counted, and you can see that just plummet from you know 790 down to 75 in this example. And so I've got a, a series of different maps to show that kind of chart the progression, and I'll move through it a little quickly because I wanted to just show how the disease has spread through the United States. So here is 2006 and 7, where just about where we are at. And so the, the United States Geological Survey puts these maps together annually to chart the spread of the infection. And by 2016, we now see the disease arriving on the west coast of the United States. And it continues to spread. Uh, you start to see the disease, or at least the presence of the fungus showing up in places like Texas. And so this is now showing up in, in a lot of areas down like California, New Mexico, and Texas. And so like I, I just said, you have instances where they find the fungus but not the disease, and that may be related to the lack of hibernation for bats down in that area. But there are still seasonal changes, so we're not out of the woods. Those bat species may also be impacted. And if you remember from a few minutes ago, I was talking about the Brazilian free tail bats, which provide all those ecosystem services. Um, if they were to, to become impacted by white nose syndrome, you'd have a cave of you know, 20 million bats at risk, and all the other large colonies that would be at risk in that area too. So that was white nose syndrome, which is a, a major conservation issue. One of the other ones is wind energy related bat mortality. And so here we have uh, Dr. Merlin Tuttle and a student that are tallying up and quantifying the bat species that they're finding under these wind turbines, I think down in Texas. So wind energy kills bats through direct collision and barrel trauma. So uh, I often get the question of um, bats can echolocate and they can navigate really well, so why are they running into turbines? Those things are spinning really fast and they're like 200 feet long. So they can't possibly see them and evade fast enough at times. There's also a phenomenon called barrel trauma, which is where the delicate capillaries and tissues in bats get ruptured by the vortices that are created by those spinning turbine blades. It's not as common as direct collision, but it does happen. But ultimately, hundreds of thousands of bats are killed every year in the United States. And there's evidence that turbines may attract solitary foliage roosting migratory bats, uh, potentially due to this prominent position on the landscape. So it's thought that since they roost at the tops of trees and they're solitary, these large structures might be a behavioral or breeding thing that are just attracting these types of bats to these structures. And so this is important because we all know climate change is an issue, right? We don't have a presentation on that today, luckily. Um, but it's true that in 2020, there was the greatest increase on record in wind energy development in the United States. And uh, looking at a paper from 2017, again, a whole bunch of words on here, if we can look down into the red rectangle. Um, this is a paper that is estimating the fatality risk of uh, wind energy related mortality to a species called the hoary bat. And they projected that the hoary bat population could decline by as much as 90% in the next 50 years, was what was the outcome of this paper. And so that was in 2017. The same, same, one of the same researchers, at least, Winifred Frick, put out a paper just last year. Uh, the important thing here is under our lowest risk scenario, uh, the median simulated population of 2.25 million hoary bats experienced a decline of 50% by 2028. So that's just a few years from now. So these are projections. It's not um, you know, actual numbers of bats that are being killed, but the projections are pretty spot on at times. So it's important to keep in mind that the, the wind energy that we are creating and the electricity we're generating from it is coming at a price. And this is a serious conservation issue that we should probably try to figure out uh, before it's too late for that species. And I'll note that there's also <coughs> two other species of migratory bat in our area that are also heavily impacted by wind energy. <coughs> so uh, now that we have some background and we know some of the, the cool things about bats and some of the problems that they face, 
we can uh, start to look a little closer at the species of bat that you can find here in New York State. So we have nine species of bat, and I've used some of these terms before, but they're kind of generically split into cave hibernating, uh, cavity roosting species, or migratory foliage roosting species. So I have a, a handful of slides where I just have a picture of their cute little faces and a little, little bit of information about them. So the little brown bat, which as we'll talk about in a few slides, is a pretty special place here at the Hike Preserve, uh, was once one of the most common mammals in North America. And this species has declined by 90 to 99% in the Northeast United States. So going from a very, very common mammal, that's why they researched them here at Hike, that's the species I started researching in Western New York because they were so common, you could go anywhere and find dozens of them to do your research. Uh, that's not the case anymore. You have the northern long-eared bat, which was also just as numerous but less encountered because northern long-eared bats are interior forest specialists, so they like older, mature trees. And so you just didn't see them a lot. Where little browns will roost in barns and houses, this species would roost you know, in the cavity in the forest somewhere. This uh, northern long-eared are currently listed as threatened by the United States Fish and Wildlife Service. They've been listed since 2014. But they are expected to be upgraded to endangered uh, probably in the next year or two. The Indiana bat is, has been federally endangered since the 60s. Luckily, they have low impacts from white nose syndrome, although there are some studies that suggest that there are synergistic impacts when you look at meta populations, white nose syndrome, and wind energy combined together. So when we're looking at issue by issue, we should keep in mind that these issues aren't separated. Everything's interrelated in, in the world, right? And again, this is a Chautauqua County presentation, so we don't have them in Chautauqua County, but they do exist in the eastern part of New York, so they could be here at night. And you have the eastern small-footed myotis, which is one of the smallest bat species in North America. They are known to roost in rocky scree cliff sides, so like the gorge that goes down to the, the reservoir, or past the reservoir actually. Um, that might be a place you could find this species as well, or up in the Catskills and the mountains on those cliff slopes. And you have the tricolored bat, which used to be called the Eastern Pipistrel until the geneticists got a hold of things and had to change the name because it's not actually a pipistrel. So, uh, now we have the fun name of tricolored, which I think is nearly as fun as pipistrel. So. <laughs> And then we have the big brown bat, which, as I said earlier, is probably the most common species that you would encounter in, uh, in most of North America and the United States. And what I always like to say about common species, they get no conservation protection. They're not threatened, they're not endangered, so they're not protected, but they do all of, not all, but they do most of the ecosystem services. So they are actually some of the most important animals, but they're not considered a, worthy of protection because they're so common. And then we move into the migratory species. So this is the silver-haired bat, which is rarely encountered. They're a little bit small, and they like to forage over uh, wetlands and, and swamps and things like that. So they're difficult for scientists to catch with mist nets or, or to physically capture. In the eastern red bat, and you might, you might note that uh, the migratory bat species tend to be more strikingly colored, and that, I think, has to do with uh, they're roosting at the tops of trees, so it's a little bit of a camouflage impact by where they roost. And where most bats have just one pup per year, eastern red bats can have three or sometimes four pups on an annual basis. And they're more often encountered than the other migratory bats because they tend to fall out of trees during the mating season. Because they're so <laughs> and just because they're so adorable at that level. <laughs> So when people tell you that bats are ugly and scary looking, you just go like, no, <laughs> And then finally, we have the hoary bat, which is one of my favorite species of bat, uh, named for the frosty nature of their fur. This is also one of the biggest bats in New York. It is the biggest bat in New York and one of the biggest in North America, with a wingspan that can reach up to a foot and a half. And so this is the species I referenced that is at risk from wind energy generation. And again, super cute, so I have that. <laughs> All right, so any questions before I move on? I'm going to kind of dive into the research side of my presentation. Yeah. Yeah. 
you talked about the uh, rate at which bats are being killed. What I'd like to know is, are they recovering from the kill rate of these mortality causes? The, I have two answers. One is, we really don't know about recovery rate because we don't know very much about their demographics. So migratory bats are solitary and they're difficult to study. But we do know that having only one pup a year and long, living a long time span, so bats can live a really long time. If you look at conservation biology, long living, slow reproducing species are at high conservation pressure. So it, it's very likely they're not replacing the, the losses that they face. So um, just a note before I move into the research side, I might have a bunch of nerdy stuff in here that I'm trying to kind of gloss over it. And there's also some students in here that I want to make sure get exposed to nerdy words. Uh, <laughs> if you have any questions on it, let me know during it if I'm moving too fast. Um, but I'm, I'm not focusing heavily on the super research side of things. I wanted to just kind of give you the, the gist of my research that I'm doing for my PhD. So with my research, I aim to address bat conservation issues that are related to white nose syndrome and wind energy development. And I want to do that through a better understanding of what habitats and what environmental variables or parameters are most important for these species. And so I'm using data on bat activity that's collected through ultrasonic bat surveys, so using an ultrasonic microphone to record bat activity and um, then employing specialized software that helps you look at the echolocation calls of bats to identify what species are there and then combining that species information with geo geographical features that you can import through like a geographic information system or a statistical modeling software. I do have an existing bioacoustic data set provided from the Department of Environmental Conservation. Every year for about 15 years now, the DEC has gone and done a mobile acoustic bat survey in each county of the state. So I've got a statewide data set to work with that spans well over a decade. And I'm also supplementing that data set in Chautauqua County with point surveys, which point surveys are what I've done here at Pike this past week. And we'll talk a little bit more in detail about that as we work through my presentation. And I've got three main research questions. So the first one is pretty simple. Is this data from the DEC useful for what I want to do? And can we actually use it to look at how bats are interacting with different habitat types? Uh, my second question is looking at the abilities of species distribution modeling, which are statistical techniques to investigate, the, like I said, the habitats and environmental variables that are most important to bats, with a special emphasis on Lazio scenarius, or the hoary bat. And then finally, because I don't want to ignore white nose syndrome at all, I wanted to do a conservation assessment of bat species that are impacted by white nose syndrome in Chautauqua County, and see where they are at because well, while we've been doing surveys, no one's really tried to do a thorough conservation assessment in my area for these types of bats. And so looking um, at experiment one, which I wanted to just look at the utility of the DEC data, I had the hypothesis that's looking at wing loading and aspect ratio and how that interacts with how bats are using habitat. So wing loading and aspect ratio are proportions related to the, the length and breadth of the wing of a bat and the length of the bat's body. And so looking at the chart over on the, the right-hand side, a bat with low wing loading and high aspect ratio would be something that is a slow-flying, open-air uh, flying type of bat that would be a long-distance migrator. We're looking at the, the bottom corner, high wing loading and low aspect ratio would be a bat species that has fast flight and cluttered environments. So without getting into the details too <clears throat> thoroughly, and the top right would be something like the hoary bat, which would be a big bat that flies above treetops or in open areas. They're not very maneuverable. Like I said, they have a, a foot and a half wingspan. So they're not something that's going to be flying between the canopy of the trees and leaves. Where in the, in the bottom, that would be something like the northern longer bat, which it's called the northern long eared bat because it has a little bit longer ears than the other bats in its genus, and that is due to the fact that they actually pick spiders and things off of the leaves of, tr of trees in a forest. So they're very maneuverable. So they have high wing loading and low aspect ratio. 
My second hypothesis relates to the uh, species distribution modeling. And so I would predict that the spatial behavior will vary by species with something like the hoary bat foraging in larger open areas of uncluttered environment. Um, there's a lot of other environmental variables I'm going to throw into my analysis, but that is kind of, in a nutshell, what I hope to find with experiment two. And then in experiment three, with my conservation assessment, I will be looking at um, several bat species in the county, or at least looking for these species. So we have the northern long bat, small-footed, tricolored, and little brown. And I know little brown bat colonies exist in the county. I actually monitor one of them um, three times a summer and have been for several years now. So my hypothesis is that the, there might be other little brown bat populations that are recovering, but I don't know about the other species. There may be evidence that they're extirpated totally from the county and they may no longer live there anymore. All right, so any questions on what I just threw at you before we move on to some of the, the basic methods? Are there bats that are uh, immune to the white nose disease? Well, I think the little brown bats in the colony I monitor, we'll talk in more detail about how that all worked out, but there's, there's either um, a genetic resistance to the disease, or there's evidence that some bats are just fatter, which might be a genetic thing. To, so bigger bats would have more fat resources and would be better able to survive the winter. And then there's a behavioral component. So we're finding that in the caves where bats hibernate, the bats that survive white nose syndrome are hibernating in different microclimates in the cave. So humidity and temperature can dictate how uh, that's okay. can dictate how uh, a bat gets infected by the fungus or not. Because the fungus is cold water, right? I actually have two questions. One is, since this is ground zero for white nose syndrome, is there the same dearth of like recovery data, population data here as there is in say where you are? I know I know of caves and hibernacula in Vermont where they're monitoring. I'm not sure if any specific data around here. Okay. That would be a question for the DEC. I'm sure they're doing and have been doing monitoring on the, the cave systems out this way. And my second question is, how has the Wind Energy Association uh, and, and or industry responded to this issue, if at all? There's a number of things that, are, that have been done to respond to the issue. So there's a lot of research on acoustic deterrence, so emitting ultrasound that can chase bats away. That's not a really perfect technology. There's a, a technique called operational curtailment, which is where they shut off the, uh, the turbines when they're low wind speed, because bats are not flying in high wind. And so they can reduce bat fatalities by 80 to 100 percent by incorporating that at a certain level. But I can also tell you, having worked on wind energy cases as an expert witness for the biological side of things, they push back on that pretty hard because mm -hmm. then they have to shut down the turbines and that reduces the bottom line. Mm -hmm. You feel like you're being somewhat responsible about it, though? No. No. So getting back on track, unless you had another question. No, that was shocking. They're, they're not being <laughs> I'm sure there's some that are better than others, but in, in my experience, they could do a, a little better. Yeah, right. um, so moving on to talk about the, the methods and how I actually do these bioacoustic bat surveys. Uh, we have, of course, a, a bat studying the same thing I'm studying. <laughs> but I, at the risk of totally digressing, it's really important to bring up this place because Donald Griffin did his graduate research here at Hikes, and his graduate research was the uh, impetus that coined the term echolocation. So he wasn't, he wasn't the first to look at bats and how they can navigate at night, but he was the first to really kind of define echolocation and discover it in a sense. And so I, I just learned that when I came here on Monday, or Monday or Tuesday. I thought that that was fantastic because I've loved bats my whole life. So coming here and doing bat surveys here, using bioacoustics at the place where Donald Griffin sort of discovered it was really, really cool for me. And so I wanted to take a couple seconds to just highlight it. Uh, I was in the archives earlier. There's Donald Griffin, the picture from some of the, in some of the drawers. Um, here's the summary of his research here at the Hype Preserve in 1939, where they talk about um, experiments designed to test the bat's ability to avoid obstacles before and after one or more senses were impaired, 
So maybe not the nicest things to do to bats, but um, he did discover this phenomenon that bats are capable of. Uh, just some more things from the archives here. There's a National Geographic article that he published, and a, a book that he published, and not my favorite thing, but I still like dead bats. I, my parents thought there was something wrong with me. It turns out I'm just a biologist. Uh, it's cool to see all that stuff in here, too. And in Donald Griffin's experiments, he had piano wires strung up and down in a barn here. And it's cool because we actually used piano wires in a, what's called a harp trap, which is shown here. This is from a cave in Cuba where we were setting this up to trap bats. So it's called a harp trap because it's a big rectangle frame with piano wire strung up and down. And as the bats emerge, they fly into it and conveniently slide down into this collection bin where you just blessed with this big bag full of bats. They're not armed. <laughs> you take them out. You, they, it's a really safe way to capture bats. Uh, the trap was invented by Marlon Tuttle uh, back in the 70s and is still used today. And um, just to comment on the abilities of bats to navigate using our location, I watched them where I, I would take a bat out of the trap, we would document and whatever, I'd let it go, and it would fly this way and then do like a U-turn and like a jet turn on its side and fly through the heart trap. So once they knew it was there, oh, wow. you're not going to catch them. You had to kind of surprise them and put the traps up at different cave entrances each time you did because they would remember that. <laughs> so I didn't digress too bad. Which is um, so bats use echolocation to forage and navigate, and they do this through essentially screaming really, really loud, so loud none of us can hear it. It's at a kilohertz level that's up above the human range of hearing. And they're listening to the echoes that bounce off of things in the landscape and interpreting the, the information contained in those echoes to navigate the forage. And so they do this to navigate and fly around in the night sky. They do this to find food. They use ultrasound as like social calls to communicate. And they can actually tell the speed and direction at which an insect is flying based on Doppler shift. So the same thing that we do with weather radar, they figured it out like, you know, years ago. <laughs> and um, they can actually tell what species of insect is there, so they can be selective about their prey just by using this type of sonar. Mm -hmm. And so I use their abilities by kind of eavesdropping on their calls and recording them using these ultrasonic microphones and uh, incorporate, interpreting the call that the bats make. So you wanted to use the search phase of a bat's call. There's three main phases, the search, approach, and terminal phase. The search phase is like they're out at the night sky just kind of flashing their high beams regularly, looking at what's there every time they turn the light on, in a sense. The approach phase, their echolocation starts to speed up. They're maybe approaching a wall, or they're approaching a big, yummy looking moth. And the ultrasound's bouncing off of that insect more frequently as they get closer to it. And in the terminal phase, the, the echolocation is, you know, thousands of times a second. It's bouncing off, and you'll, you'll see this little mm -hmm. in the, the sonogram that comes out of it. So I use the search phase in my research because this is what you want to use to identify species. It's the most standardized form of their echolocation call. And so this is what it looks like when you take this bioacoustic data and you use the software to create what's called a sonogram which is uh, frequency down here versus time. And this is an echolocation call of a little brown bat that I recorded um, at the Casanova Lakes Nature Park in Chautauqua County. Along the top in red, you have an oscillogram, which is measuring the amplitude of the call, so kind of the, the strength of the call, which represents sort of how close the bat was to the microphone or how far away the bat was from the microphone. And we'll look at this uh, particular call a little bit closer uh, later on in the presentation. And so for my research, I used a variety of different parameters to identify different bat species. So you have where it says CFFM, that means constant frequency versus frequency modulated. So that's a fancy way of saying, is it steep up and down or flat and horizontal? And if you look at here where it says LACI, that's Lazieros Cinereus, they have a relatively constant frequency call. So their calls are usually fairly static and flat, relatively low frequency. Whereas you look at the bottom one, the Myotis lucificus, which is the little brown bat, you can see how very steep those calls are. So that's one of the first things you look at is the, the steepness of the call. 
You also identify the minimum frequency, so where the call ends. Hoary bats tend to have a minimum frequency around 20 kilohertz. Uh, little brown bats tend to have a minimum frequency around 40 kilohertz. And most bats in the myotis genus that little browns are in have that same minimum frequency. And then one of the other, there's a few other things that you look at, but one of the other major parameters is the slope of the bat's call. And the slope of the call is important if you're trying to tease out whether you have like a little brown, northern long-eared, or Indiana bat. And if you remember, northern long-eared bats are federally threatened, Indiana bats are federally endangered. So for any larger project that goes on that you need a consultant to do like an environmental assessment, you need to be sure of which species you have because if it's a protected species that changes your project and means you need more permits from the Fish and Wildlife Service and things like that. So these are uh, the, the major parameters in using echolocation calls to identify species. And so I've got two different bat survey methods that I use. We have mobile acoustic bat surveys, which is an active method where I have an ultrasonic microphone on the roof of my car and I drive around a predetermined transect at a standard rate of speed. So by keeping it at about 20 miles an hour, I can be sure that I'm recording different individual bats because I'm flying in and out of the bat's airspace. So you can do population level studies with this method. And that's what it looks like. So I borrow this from the state every year. It's just a, a microphone in a PVC tube with a magnet on the bottom that you plug into your laptop and drive around and have a good old time. <laughs> the other method I use, so this is what I've been doing here at Hike this week, is a passive detection protocol using uh, just putting an ultrasonic microphone up in the right place and leaving it there overnight or for extended periods of time um, to uh, determine whether a northern long ear bat is present or absent you need to do a minimum of 14 nights of surveys over the course of the summer so there's a few different things that you do to, um, depending on your research question. And also to determine whether a, a northern long bat or an Indiana bat is present, you would want to place microphones in two different locations per research site. So here at Hike, I put them at six different locations. And you want to make sure your microphone is in an uncluttered space. So not a lot of tree branches right in front of the microphone. Uh, you want to avoid power lines and things like that because all of that can interfere with the call that you record. And having a high quality recording is critical in separating out those different species like Indiana and Northern long and Little Brown Bats. And this is what my equipment looks like. So you have an ultrasonic microphone created by Wildlife Acoustics that connects to this uh, monitoring unit that actually records. There's two different uh, U not USB, SD cards, storage cards that are in there. And these are really efficient machines, so I can, with four D-cell batteries, have this deployed for up to 45 days at a time. Mm -hmm. So for long-term monitoring, I know you're, you're thinking like two weeks of surveys just to determine. You can just set this up and walk away. And you probably want to go and make sure no bears have eaten it. <laughs> that has happened, believe me. Not to my stuff, luckily. Until tomorrow when I go and check on it. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that's why I started to eat my words right after I said that. And so the reason I'm doing the two different methodologies, so mobile surveys are useful for population monitoring, remember, so you can actually do, match the bat's flying speed, so you, you're more assured that each individual bat call you record is from an individual, uh, not individual species, but an individual bat. But there are issues with roadside bias, so northern long-eared bats really don't like to forage around trails and roads. They like their interior forest specialists. So you bias the types of species that you could be recording. Point surveys are, like I said, are useful for long-term deployments and you can put them at the interior of a forest if you find like a tall enough canopy and an open enough flight path. But there's no way of telling whether you've recorded one bat flying around three times or three individual bats flying around once. So it's not useful for population monitoring in that way. You can create like an activity index of bat calls. So there's different ways to interpret it and get that information, but not individual bats. Can, can you hear and recognize some of the calls? Mm -hmm. I can't hear them. I can look at them on a screen and sort of read that. Read it, but not hear it. Yeah, none of us can hear. hear. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Why don't you get the issue with resampling the roadside? That's drives. 
Say that one more time. Like you said, you can't use point services to determine the amount of individual bats. Why is it not the same as the roadside if you're going the same speed as the bat? That doesn't make sense to me. You're, you're in the bat's airspace for maybe two seconds. Gotcha. And so you're recording it, and you have your call, and then you, um, there's like a hundred millisecond threshold between that when you're doing your analysis so that you know that because bats are echolocating at such a high frequency, they're separated by enough time that you have to separate them. And so um, just to reinforce why I'm doing these different methodologies, so I've got the acoustic point and roadside surveys, and I'm also looking at roosts of bats and counting bats while they're roosting. This is standard stuff that the uh, North American Bat Monitoring Program advises using these three different methodologies for those uh, various species. And uh, I don't know if anyone's familiar with Chautauqua County, but this is the locations of my surveys. So I have four different mobile survey routes in the county, and then six different point survey locations. And uh, I've selected my point survey locations based on good habitat. I've also selected them based on previous records of northern long-eared bats, whether it's acoustic records or records of them actually being captured. All right, so getting back to the, the more active research. So in experiment one, I've already gotten a pretty good chunk of that completed. So I uh, published my first paper at the end of last year, which used uh, data that I collected from my master's research and, and analyzed that to um, look at how bats are foraging differentially in the landscape. And so that's what we did here. We used a technique called mixed models regression analysis to look at the statistical significance of bats' activity on a habitat with respect to other bats that are in that in, in overall analysis. And I also created a point density overlay in geographic information systems, which looked at how dense the number of bat calls were along those roadside transects. So these are the two transects that were used in this experiment. So this is called the Jamestown transect, which runs from what's called Bear Lake down to a, a small town called Falconer. And another transect that's just kind of up in the hills of Chautauqua County uh, with no real villages or cities to speak of. <laughs> this is some of the results of that. So these are the proportion of bat calls uh, by habitat type. And so you can look at this chart and very clearly see there's some sort of relationship with forest there, right? So 70% of the calls I recorded had forest as a component of the habitat where they were at. So forests are clearly important. And looking at the uh, point call density map that I made, so just to walk you through it real quick, uh, the red box here is blown up to these two boxes. They're, they're exactly the same. Uh, and the box on the left, I have no map underneath it, so you can just see the density of bat calls. On the, the box on the right, I have land cover type underneath that. So when I say bat call density, it's a technique in, in mapping that is taking the, all the numbers of calls that I've recorded and calculating where they are the most dense and where they are the least dense. And so what I thought was really interesting is down here, you can, you can see this agricultural area. So the brown represents cultivated crops. And you can see that bat calling density is pretty heavy above and below that, but when you get into that area, the bat call density seems to decline. And so that was a very interesting result uh, that I hope to look a little bit more closely at with the next step in the experiment. So there are results um, that had significant bat habitat interactions, and so that's shown on the table here. There were both negative and positive statistically significant interactions. Unfortunately, because I used only presence data, I'm not unable in this part of my experiment to directly compare bat calling with habitat type. It's bat calling with respect to the other bat species that are, it's a little confusing. But, uh, <laughs> so what I need to do is do a further step in the analysis and incorporate absence data. And so that's what I'll be doing next. So. But through incorporating absence data, you can do what's called logistic regression modeling. So that's just a statistical technique. Again, I told you it would be nerdy words. 
uh, that makes predictive models. And so what my advisor, my one advisor helped me do was using coding. He actually picked at the spots on my transect where bats were not recorded and created pseudo absence points. So they're not real absence points because we haven't recorded there for years and years and we've never recorded a bat here. It's just kind of in relation to the other calls that I had. But by generating that type of data, I can now use logistic regression modeling. And in a similar paper, so this is in the Mediterranean region, these are uh, predicted foraging suitability for several species of bat in the Mediterranean. And so this is something I'd like to do here. The difference is uh, these researchers didn't have a 15-year data set. They only had like a few hundred points of data to work with. When I go through and do this, I will have thousands and thousands of, of points using different methods. So it's, it's subtly different. All right, any questions on experiment one before I, I move on? Um, yeah. I have a little wildlife acoustics uh, thing that plugs into my iPhone. Yeah, I do too. And I, I love this thing. And many of the species, um, I've, I've had it for, well, it's my wife's actually. <laughs> for the last three years. <laughs> And um, many of the species you've talked about, uh, the horidae and the mysos, uh, little brown bat, big brown bat, they've all shown up at one time or another. Yeah, the tricolor. Cool. Which is the tricolor was the other night. And, um, but it's not that expensive. I mean, no, they're only not. And they're very handy. Only a few hundred dollars. Oh. Yeah. So the, the issue with using the auto classifier on the iPad is it's about 80% accurate. So okay. to, to really know what species are there, you, you do have to look at it with their Wildlife Acoustics Kaleidoscope Pro software to look really closely. So it's a, it's a really useful tool for recording calls to, for like research. Mm -hmm. You do need to look at each individual one manually to be sure. But that is what I will be using after this for our bat walk when I'm done blathering here about bats for a while. That's cool. Okay. okay. Yeah. Yep. Um, are you planning to look at <clears throat> the agricultural land that seems to be less densely uh, populated with bats as a uh, perhaps a cause of that being the insecticizer being used in that particular type of farming in Chautauqua mm -hmm. County. I would love to look that closely at it. That's probably going to be a few steps after my dissertation is complete. What I am doing is uh, I'm putting these point survey locations in a grape vineyard and in a cornfield. Yeah. And so for the species distribution modeling portion of my research, I can look at how that relates in terms of like foraging suitability or habitat suitability for these bats. And then I would really like to look closer and look at what type of crop was there. And like you were saying, maybe examine the site history and when uh, certain chemicals had been applied and how that relates. Um, to do that, you probably want to have one of these microphones up all summer. Mm -hmm. So you can chart like after plowing or after planting and you know they do fertilizer, they do herbicide, they do insecticides. So all of these different things that they're putting on the crops, I would like to investigate that closer. Well I would think that you're going to find that the grape are, the grape crop is very heavily chemically treated. Yeah. And that they're after insects. <laughs> yeah, I, I worked at an organic vineyard near Fredonia. And the guy who grew those grapes was unable to sell them to Welch's because Welch's requires that you use chemical treatments. Oh, Jesus. Wow. So he would drive his grapes from Fredonia down to D.C. and sell them down in D.C. to like the Congress people and the fancy people. Okay, so um, moving on along to my next experiment. This will be a little bit briefer because I don't have a lot necessarily done. This is what I'm working on this summer. So like I said, I'm using what are called species distribution models. And these are established statistical techniques that um, include things like the generalized linear model, boosted regression trees, and maximum entropy, which, again, a bunch of nerdy words there. So we'll just see what I mean by that on the next slides. <laughs> I've also mentioned a lot of the environmental variables that I plan to incorporate. So here's a list of some of that information that I would be pumping into this analysis. So, the Nature Conservancy has data on habitats of the Northeast United States, as well as landforms. So they have information on you know, what direction the slope is facing, how steep the slope is, et cetera. And you can also derive some of that information from the, the USGS has the National Land Cover Data Set, 
The USGS also supplies LIDAR, which is light detection and ranging. They're flying an airplane above the landscape and shooting fancy lasers at the Earth. And then using that information, you get very high resolution elevation data from that. So I can create digital elevation models. I could also look at different characteristics of the landscape, like the roughness, slope aspect, what position that slope is at on the hill slope the height of the canopy of the forest even. So you can get a lot of information out of that. I'll also be incorporating canopy age, climate, invasive species cover, and what's called the normalized difference vegetation index, which is a fancy science guy way of saying the extent to which plants are growing. Right. So you can incorporate all of these things, again, in relation to bat activity. So what I'm hoping to tease out are maps like this. So. This would be using the generalized linear regression modeling. This is a project where they, uh, these researchers did uh, looking at differences in sex in hoary bats and how that difference responded in different times of the year. They used about, again, about 1,000 museum records over 50, 60 years. So again, not as many records as I would be using at a much more coarse scale. So they're looking at the whole continent where I'm zooming in on a county. Boosted regression trees are uh, another statistical technique that, in a nutshell, puts out what are called partial dependence plots. So these graphs show different spikes, right? So for example, we'll look at this here. This spike is telling me that for whatever species you're looking at, the maximum downstream slope of around zero degrees is best for that species. So if this is a fish, it likes a flat slope in the creek. Whereas a steeper creek slope, you probably wouldn't find that fish. So that's kind of what I'm trying to do, but with bats. And then the other technique I'll be using is called maximum entropy or maxence. So this is a program designed specifically for species distribution modeling. It's a really high performing method that helps take out any bias. So it, I could put a microphone up in a few different locations and not worry about maybe I'm oversampling one location because the, the statistics that are built into the software help account for that. And in the, this example from 2016, researchers in North Dakota looked at habitat suitability for six species of bat in that state. And so I'd be doing something similar, again, looking at the county level instead of the state level. And what I hope to do is perfect these methods at the county level and then extrapolate that to the state level so I would have a very high resolution analysis of habitat suitability for the whole state. All right, and then moving on to my third experiment. So again, we, we talked about at the beginning how you have multiple bat species in Chautauqua County that have had substantial population declines at the landscape level associated with white nose syndrome, but there hasn't really been a thorough assessment of where those bats are at currently. And so I will be incorporating acoustic surveys, so the, the point surveys I'd be doing, I'm employing not just to record bats for the species distribution modeling, but also using the Fish and Wildlife Service protocol so that I can, while I'm recording the bats, I can try to look for species like the northern long bat that's shown here. And so again, I'm, I'm looking to determine presence or absence of the northern long bat in Chautauqua County. And so just a little research update. So we have looked at this image earlier on in the presentation. This is confirmed Myotis lucificus, or little brown bat call, at the Casadega Lakes Nature Park. And so this is really cool because most of the little brown bats in the county have largely vanished. The larger maternity colonies that were there have collapsed. And uh, this was just discovered uh, two or three weeks ago. I made this recording. I was looking at the recording and I thought this looks pretty cool, so I sent it to the guy who trained me and he's like, yeah, that's cool. Uh, but just to give you some of the parameters so you see how I actually make this determination. So you're looking at the spectrogram of a bat's echolocation call and you use what's called bandwidth. So bandwidth is looking at how much space is in between the beginning and end of that echolocation call. And for little brown bats, the bandwidth is less than 75 kilohertz. If this was a northern long-eared bat, it would be over 80 kilohertz. So bandwidth is just uh, subtracting here from here, if that makes, if that makes sense. You're also looking at the duration of the call. So how long does it take them to go from here to here? 
And for little brown bats, that's about six milliseconds. So it takes about six milliseconds for a bat to make an echolocation call. And then I also talked about slope. So here the slope is in octaves per second. And you have to use a different software program. So I end up using three different sound analysis software programs to make this determination. Um, the little brown bat, the slope is less than 80 octaves per second. And in addition to the acoustic surveys that I'm doing, uh, like I mentioned, I've been monitoring a little brown bat maternity colony since 2016. And so I've got, I'm finally getting some long-term data to work with. Uh, again, maternity colonies are where female bats go every year. Their daughters go with them, too, to the same colony site to give birth and raise their pups. This uh, particular colony that I'm talking about had a pre-white-nose syndrome population in excess of 1,400 bats. There's seven bat houses on this guy's barn in Chautauqua County that were just loaded with little brown bats. There was definitely a population crash after white-nose syndrome, but a slow recovery is being documented, so I can show you that in the next few slides. But just to, to talk about my methods, I go in mid-June, mid-July, and mid-August, so I'm a little late right now. I'll be doing this next week when I get home. Um, I go and do photo counts in the afternoon, so I take what I, what I think are really awesome pictures <laughs> up inside the bat house, and then I can count their cute little faces <laughs> and see how many are there. But I also go back the same evening and do an emergence count. So myself and some volunteers, I usually drag my wife along. We sit outside of this barn and stare at the barn for two hours. <laughs> Click, clicker count bats as they fly out of the bat house. So I'm, I'm making counts from the photographs and counts from the emergence data as well. And so just to kind of move through time, this is a pre white nose syndrome. So early 2000s, a woman named Caroline Bissell took this picture when the colony was 1,400 bats. Not all of those 1,400 bats are in this bat house. This is one of the bat houses as an example. You fast forward to August 2016 when I visited this colony with Dr. Merlin Tuttle and there were about 37 bats left in this one bat house. So that's, if you do the math, that is about a 90, 99% decline. And I don't want to do math, so we just have to trust me. <laughs> but uh, fast forwarding to 2021, last August, so the good news is the total colony size had increased to 150 plus bats. So that's important because there are clearly more bats than there were when I first started monitoring. And if we look at this kind of charted out in the graph, I have the emergence count dates on the bottom and the number of bats on the, the other column. You can see that the trend line is August when I'm at that point and do the same thing here that I've done in Chautauqua County. I don't think I can do that in every county of the state. Right? <laughs> I don't have any, any uh, little helpers to do work for me, so I do a lot of driving. But I do have other states in the region who have the same mobile data. So Vermont, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, and Connecticut have all, all of their bat biologists have given me kind of unofficial permission to use their data, so when I'm at that point, I can get other long-term data sets and do not only the statewide analysis, but landscape-level Northeast United States kind of analysis, which would be pretty cool. Mm -hmm. And then finally, I wanted to just show this sonogram, which I haven't identified yet, but holy crap, does it look like a really steep call, right? So it's starting up almost at 120 kilohertz and ending uh, down just under 40, so the bandwidth of that would be about 80 kilohertz or more, which could mean this is a northern liner bat colony. Mm -hmm. I don't want to get ahead of myself, but that would be really cool to record that here because they have declines over 99% through most of the state. Mm -hmm. If you wanted to misnet this bat and find a maternity colony, you would have to put 150 nights of effort in to catch a lactating female and then radio track her back to the roost to find where the young are at. So they're very, very uncommon now. Um, so if this is that call, and I, I again need to look closer at it with the right software, that would be really exciting news. So um, these are my references. <laughs> <laughs> if, if anybody's really interested, I can certainly email them. <laughs> yeah. And uh, with that, that's my last slide. And